um, that talks about how you understand who your audience is and how to take them where you want them to go. It's getting much more and more important. I'm going to show you something at the very end that's the title from a Broadway a song in a Broadway show that's I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing than a hundred people's ninth favorite thing. And it's one of those things that today it may be more important to you as a brand to be popular, very, to be actively engaged with a smaller number of users than necessarily just to be something else that exists in the life of a, a bigger number of users. We all talk about kids having complete access to and complete control over their media experiences now, that they can watch and do what they want, when they want it, wherever they want it. And we think of that as being a really good thing. But I'll tell you that we're finding something in Dubbitt's research that um, I think leads to this question of fanatomy, and that is kids are frustrated, they're overwhelmed. That's what a child's uh, media universe looks like now, only that's just a small percentage of the things that they are, are looking at. Dubbitt does a trend survey, 2,000 families in the US every six months, 1,000 families in the UK, and about a dozen other countries that we rotate through five or six at a time. This is probably a little too small to read, but the key thing to take away from it is wherever we go in the world, US, UK, Australia, Brazil, uh, Malaysia, wherever we go, kids are telling us that often or sometimes they are having trouble finding the content that they want. It's not that it's not there, it's all out there for them, but they're having trouble separating the noise, separating out the noise from the content and finding what it is that they want. So 60% and more are telling us this, that they're frustrated. And that's exacerbated by the fact that the top brands in their lives are taking up more and more of that attention. When we talk to kids, when we do our trend survey, we ask them, what are you watching? What are you reading? What are you playing with? Open-ended questions, not, not leading them with a list of brands, but just tell us what, what you're interested in, what you're doing. You can see that in just two years, it's gone from just under 800 brands that they mention independently, so that's 2,000 kids since it's the UK data, to over 1,000 different brands. And even more important, the top five brands, the mega brands in their lives, the Paw Patrols, the Legos, the YouTubes, have gone from being 16% of what they are, of, of the mentions that they make, to over a quarter. So there's a lot of power invested in those top five brands. And then you've got that long tail going out from there. And let me show you how that breaks out. You've got your blockbusters, you've got your Paw, Paw Patrols that are taking up that, that, you know, just a huge amount of kids' attention. You've got on the right side that I picked an image from uh, Cyber Chase, which is one of the things that would show up in a very small number of kids' um, surveys. But it also means that if there are a very small number who are thinking about that, that's a passion brand for them. That's something that they are, are um, you know, they love and they want to pay attention to. They want to make sure you know about. And then in the middle, you've got this big block of efficiency brands where they need to find a way to less expensively or more efficiently get their content out to kids. A lot of the games, the online games that kids play, you see in that. Some of the smaller um, video on demand like Hopster and things like that, you would see in that efficiency brand that they need to find ways to either reduce costs or in some other way get a sustainable audience of children because they're not going to push their way up into the blockbusters without spending a huge amount of money. And well, and they don't really, they can't really sustain themselves as a passion brand. So we came up with the term fanatomy to try to explain how it is you have to understand your audience in order to, to get there. And I, I thought the Yogi Berra quote was appropriate because Brands are not st static in kids' lives. They change. They change their meaning with how kids interact with them. They change what the, um, where the kids find them and, ha and what the, how they display their love for it. So if you don't understand your audience and you don't know where you want to take them, you're going to end up somewhere else. This research, by the way, the Fanatomy research came out of some work that we did for Nickelodeon and they, that they've allowed us to, uh, to talk about, which had to do with going into kids' houses and talking to them not only about what are you doing, what are you playing, but how do you express your love for a brand? How, when you find something you really like, how do you play with it? How do you wear it? How do you talk about it? What role does it take on in your life? So this is the Fanatomy chart that we put together from that. 
And you can start with a brand anywhere on that chart. You could start in the middle with, with dedicated fans who interact with your brand. You could start with super fans. Minecraft is one of the greatest examples of starting with super fans. People who were willing to go into the code and really play with it themselves and really built the brand because they were so dedicated to it. Or you can start from a casual brand. You can be something that kids watch on TV every day and they're really glad to have it there, but it's not something that they really care that much about. But what you need to figure out is where you want to go. And that becomes kind of a, a, a tennis match of, with your audience where you put out your expression of the brand. You tell kids what you believe your brand is all about. They come back to you with their interpretation. And through that negotiation, you start to add more content that allows them to relate more to the brand, to participate more in the brand, to be more a part of it and they come back to you with their reaction to it. And over time, you start building their feeling of ownership of the brand, and that's how you move people from casual to super fan. There are cases, and you'll see an example here, where you want to move people from being more deeply involved to being more broadly involved. I'm going to give you just one quick example, and that's because Shira Katz from Netflix is going to speak next about how they build their fans, how they build Fanatomy. And I think it's interesting to compare two platforms that kids are, are very, that are extraordinarily popular with kids, Netflix and Nickelodeon. And where this started for us was thinking about the fact that when kids, when Nickelodeon was first around, and even still to some extent, kids happily wore the Nickelodeon splat. They identified as Nick kids. They wore it on their t-shirts. Have you ever seen a kid wearing a Netflix t-shirt? It's not the brand that they wear on the t-shirt. It's the sub-brands of Netflix. And that's because it's the difference between being a portal and a clubhouse. Netflix, for them, is a portal. It's bought by the parents for themselves. They're really happy to have kids' content there. And Netflix keeps, kids, keeps parents from churning, from turning off Netflix, from unsubscribing. Their kids keep families from turning off Netflix because that's when kids scream. If they lose the programs that they really love, then kids make a fuss. But it is a content fan base. There's something there for everyone, and Shira will talk more about that. Whereas Nickelodeon was created as a kid's clubhouse. Come here, we, we're gonna bring you something that you're gonna love. You just know that we're gonna have something great for you here. Those are changing. The way, as I said, brands are not static. They have to change. Carla Fisher from Netflix talks about how they're becoming more interactive. They're trying to add more interactive features to move kids uh, from that casual fan, it's there, I love it, I really want it to be there, but I don't interact with it much, toward the super fan by making it more interactive, giving them more ownership of the brand. Whereas Nickelodeon is suddenly realizing, wait a minute, there's a lot of competition out there and people are not knowing the Nickelodeon brand any longer necessarily, they're knowing our sub-brands. Maybe we need to move them back a little bit toward becoming Nickelodeon kids. So if you look at it on our Fanatomy chart, the way that shows up is Netflix is trying to move toward Superfan by becoming more interactive. Nickelodeon is trying to maintain or build its share by becoming more casual fan oriented. I didn't mention at the beginning, you see the word consistency in there. Kids are the fastest bullshit detectors out there right now. And if you are not consistent about your brand, about how you present your brand, if you do things for the wrong reason, they'll nail you on it every time and they'll leave you behind. So I'll leave you with the question I started with, which is what's your brand's fanatomy? Are you nine people's favorite thing? Are you a hundred people's ninth favorite thing? Where do you want to be in this? Because when you come right down to it, when families have to make decisions about where to spend, it's going to be on the things that have the most emotional impact on their kids. Nine people's favorite thing, may, they may be much more willing to spend on than if it's just something their kids are happy to have but don't care that much about. And with that, I'm around for a while. That's how to get me, but I'm gonna turn it over to Shira Katz. Uh, hi, my name is Shira, and I'm on a team at Netflix called Enhanced Content. And one of our main jobs is to package and present every single movie and show on Netflix. Um, basically, we think of each piece of content as a gift waiting to be opened. And the packaging, the gift wrap, the bow, all those things are really important. So let's talk about the gift wrap. So this is a show display page or a movie display page from our non-kids site. And I've blurred out the text on the left because we're going to play kids. 
So let's say you're a six-year-old kid, you can't yet read, maybe you can read a little bit, but you can't read well. Pretend this is what you see. And I'm gonna ask you a question, which is, what do you think this movie is about? Anyone wanna venture a guess? It's not a trick question, it's just to get you in the mindset. What's that? A pet? Great, thank you. What else? Anything else that you notice here? Kids front and center, good. Two various groups of people behind them, and one more thing. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so that was excellent. Um, yeah, I think if I were a six-year-old, I'd probably notice that girl in the front. I would wonder, like, how old is she? Is she older than me? I think so. I think I would definitely notice the funny people on the right. I might think that's, like, that guy on the very right is hilarious. I think I might see the animal behind. And there are all these clues, but what you wouldn't see if you were a kid and you couldn't read is that this is rated TVMA, that's mature, and the synopsis, if you could read, would say, a gentle giant and the girl who raised her are caught in the crossfire between animal activism, corporate greed, and scientific ethics. This is a very, very, very mature movie um, out of Korea. And I think it just goes to show how important pictures are and the wrapping paper there. So let's go to the kids area on Netflix and we really, really try and stress our visuals there. So the images are so important because we know that the majority of kids in our area actually can't read. So there are like four words on the page, funny adventures. Notice we don't use adventure, which is an adult word, a genre, a formal adventure, but adventures. And at the top, we have something called the character bar. The character bar really sort of like snips out or excises these characters for kids to see front and center, looking at them. A lot of kids have relationships with um, characters. They believe that they exist in real life. So we wanna give them um, these characters front and center so that they can sort of maintain that relationship on a high contrast background too, so they can really see them. Another thing we do to really uh, bring out passions for kids is to speak to their passions. I have um, one big passion for families and kids around the world is Christmas. Now my name is Shira Katz and I don't actually celebrate Christmas, but I work at Netflix and we do all kinds of global research and we know that in every country around the world, no matter what religion it is, Christmas is important and someone's gonna wanna watch this. So this Christmas tree actually goes into all of our holiday content. When we made the icon for it, um, it was actually really challenging. It was the first icon in our character bar that we've ever put there. And so we thought, okay, let's get a designer who really, really is playful, knows kids. The designer is fabulous. She came back with a very, I would say, uh, perfect looking Christmas tree. You might find it in like catalog of Pottery Barn. It was two-toned, it was really sleek. I was like, this is perfect. It's a little too perfect for our character bar because look at all the people on the right. They have personality, you can sort of get what they're about and we couldn't understand what that Christmas tree was about. So we asked her to go back to the drawing board and as you can see, this Christmas tree is a bit more asymmetric. It has that many, many more colors and if you drew eyes and a mouth and a nose on it, it would almost be talking to you. So I think we really wanna think about personality and bringing those things out for kids. Can everything become a character? That's what I always ask myself. Another way we speak to kids' passions is through the content. When I first got to Netflix, um, everything in the kids' area was made for kids. So Luna Petunia, um, you know, Barney, all those things that you would expect to be there. And we added in all these things you wouldn't expect to be there that spoke to their passions. Stuff on baking, stuff on nature, stuff on um, like really any kind of area, passion area that we thought kids would be into. And um, my friend Zach actually at work was telling me about his son who's really, really into Octonauts. He's like obsessed with Octonauts. And uh, he'd watch, he watched it for a year, like every single day, multiple times. And then one day they went to the aquarium. And Zach said his son was like, those things are the things that I saw in Octonauts. So he connected the online and the offline world. And then Zach and his wife said, well, you know, do you wanna learn more? And the kids said, yeah. So they watched The Blue Planet, which is about the history of the oceans. And then they went to the ocean, and this was like every step, online, offline, online, offline, was a learning experience reinforcing itself for Zach and his family. They were so excited. So personalization is also key. So we have the tech 
to be able to do this. We have algorithms. We can you know, give different experiences to different kids. We have a whole team of 30 plus people who watch every single minute of all of our content, and they tag it. They're looking for themes, storylines, tones. They really want to make this experience personalized for kids, so we're identifying all these things that could appeal. Puss in Boots, for example. Um, storylines, talking animals, adventures, fairy tales. Those are just examples. There's a lot more. Character traits of Puss. Well, Puss is charming, courageous, determined. All these things allow us to flexibly merchandise this title. So Puss in Boots, you see, is in three different rows here. One, animal tales. Two, adventures. Three, animated. It has all these different tags, and it allows the kid who's really into animals find Puss there. The kid who's really into adventures can find Puss there. So we are trying to like be really flexible for kids so we can meet them where they are, not telling them, hey, this is a story about animals. You should want to watch it, even if they don't like animals. Personalization with images is really important, too. So this is, um, I would say this is a big tech feat for us. It took us a long time to do this. But what we can do, actually, is give many, many, many images randomly to different people and see which one entices kids to watch a particular show or movie. So here, there's a show called Super Monsters, and I want you to guess which image actually enticed the most number of kids in the US to watch this show. The one on the left, the one in the middle, or the one on the right? OK, the show of hands. Who thinks the one on the left? OK, who thinks the one in the middle? Uh-huh, and who thinks the one on the right? Wow, I think you guys actually got this one. Uh, it's the one on the right. Now remember, there are different clusters, so different kids pick different ones, but the majority of kids pick the one on the right. Okay, we can do this in every country too, which is really cool. So this was in Denmark, where they apparently call super monsters super monstrous. I did not say that well at all. But here, um, I would love to know which ones you think won in Denmark. So again, one on the left, the one in the middle, the one on the right. The one on the left. Okay, the one in the middle, and the one on the right. Okay, I think we didn't get it this time. I love it. The one on the left was the one that won in Denmark. I have my theories. David said maybe it's because she's like really actively doing something. Um, you know, you you can think about why. It's very very hard to guess. Like every time we have someone guess, you know, they're wrong. <laughs> so um, this is a really cool technology for us. Lastly. Families are essential to kids' passions. If kids see their parents excited about something or like talking to them about something, they're going to get so excited too. So we did two campaigns this year that really helped with this. One was around New Year's Eve, and the other one was around uh, kids' birthdays. So the first one was at New Year's Eve, and we did nine little videos with kids' favorite characters counting down 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. And of course, at quote midnight, kids could celebrate. Now, of course, midnight wasn't midnight for many parents. The whole goal of this was to give parents a way for, to celebrate it, like, you know, anywhere from noon to 8 p.m. And they'd be like, OK, go to bed. We're going to go out and party now. So um, you know, the New Year's campaign was really fun for parents and kids. It was a way for them to bond and to celebrate the New Year. Lastly, birthdays. September 15th is the day when the most kids in the world are born. And so on that day, we released 15 short videos um, with kids' favorite characters wishing them a happy birthday. So they would sing happy birthday to them. And this was really successful because, you know, who doesn't like to be wished a happy birthday? And kids getting wished happy birthday from their very, very favorite character was so special to them. So um, in short, or in sum, a summary, four takeaways. Uh, make your UI highly visual. Remember how much that text can be alienating to, you, to kids who can't read. Two, speak to kids' passions. Figure out where they are and try to um, offer something that they will love at different stages and ages. Three, make it personal. If you can, this costs money, but see if you can offer different experiences to different people, especially through any kind of algorithm, so it's personalized to different people. And lastly, very importantly, include families. They're going to just amp up the fun for their kids, up until a certain age, especially. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. Since everybody, since it's a break, would you like to take a couple of questions? Sure. Anybody have any questions? What is the One second. One second. One second.
What is the certain age that um, kids start to alienate their parents <laughs> when they're on their own? Uh, good question. It depends on the kid and the parent and the relationship. I think we see that it's really hard after age seven for a lot of parents to um, put a lot of rules into place and um, to sort of, I would say, more sort of dictate a lot of what kids do and watch. That said, I mean, I think especially with the generations of parents we have today, we see so many parents co-viewing with kids through adulthood. I know a friend who's you know grown, and she has two, three kids in college, and they watch the Gilmore Girls at the same time uh, from different locations in the United States. And they were up until like all hours of the morning. So I feel like that bonding can go on forever, but at a time when kids can get, you know, um, they don't like, are bucking the rules a little bit more, even as early as like seven or eight, I, I hate to say. <laughs> This is going to be the last question, and you can grab Shira on the back. Okay, thank you, Shira. Um, so number three is personalization. And so for this to be the case, if there's uh, multiple siblings in the household, mm. they need to have individual profiles. And so have you seen that uh, kids, because there is personalization, they want to you know, leave their sisters or brothers to go to their own? Uh, that's such a good question. So, um, you know, X percentage of profiles on Netflix, yeah, are shared, and you're, you know people are watching, because you see the patterns of like, okay, there's, you know, dino trucks, and there's Jesse, and you're like, I don't think that's the same kid, for example. Um, we see, uh, we, you know, at Netflix, we encourage people to make their own profiles, otherwise there's lots of profile pollution. But if not, which is the case many times, I think it is really, really, uh, we see a lot of negotiation. So these elaborate rules that siblings make up where they're like, okay, it's my turn this time and next time it's your turn. And actually older kids are particularly good at watching out for the appropriateness level for their younger kids. So even though they wanna watch you know, um, uh, Project MC Squared, for example, they know where their sibling is at like intuitively and they'll age down their choice for the day. So. I give older kids in particular a lot of credit in this realm because we see them being kind, pretty sensitive to their younger kids. Thank you.